Welcome to My Life, Chassidus Applied, episode 438. This program is dedicated by Zevi Drizen in honor of his birthday on the first day of Rosh Chodesh Adar, Lamed Shvat, the 30th of Shvat. We have a Shnas Atzloche and Brochus, Begashmis and Beruchnis, much Nachas from self and entire family. The Eirech Yomim Vishanim Tapes. So we're about to enter the joyous month of Adar, Mishanichnas Adar Marvin Besimcha. As Adar arrives, enters, we increase in joy. So this week is Rishchidosh Adar. So we'll talk about that. This week is also Parshas uh, Truma, the Pasha of the Mishkan, where the sanctuary is built. And we'll discuss that all in the context of Chassidus Applied. And just if you're new to this program, just a short overview, even if you're not new to the program, it always is good to refresh and remember the focus, the mission. And that is that the Baal Shem Tov heard from Mashiach, when will you come? When your wellsprings, the wellsprings of Chassidus, of Primi Satera, will spread, be distributed, and disseminated chutza to the outskirts, and as the Rebbe emphasizes, chutza she'en chutza mimena, to the farthest outskirts. What does that mean? It doesn't just mean physically to every corner of the earth. It includes that, but it also means to every paradigm on earth, to every type of person, to every person with any type of background, or no background for that matter, even though there's not such a thing as no one without any background, but I mean to say not necessarily one type of background. And Chassidus is relevant because this is part of the blueprint that God gave us of how to live our lives in fulfilling our calling, our mission, our divine mission, and to be the best we can possibly be in transforming this world into a divine home. So Chassidus Applied, this program, My Life Chassidus Applied, which began 10 years ago, focused on taking any issue that we're struggling with or dealing with, it doesn't have to be a struggle necessarily, and demonstrating how Teir Chassidus gives us insight and direction and guidance and clarity at whatever topic that may be. So no questions are taboo, nothing is off limits, everything can be asked. You go to chassidusapply.com, we have a forum where you can ask any question anonymously, completely anonymously, as well as many resources, including all the previous archive programs, they're all time-stamped, so you can find them by subject and go straight to the topic you're looking for. really covers from A to Z the entire spectrum. As well as essays and other submissions, artistic submissions, um, creative submissions that people from all over submitted in applying chassidus to a particular issue in life. And more resources, including, I should announce, for those that may not be aware, a class that I give every day in Chassidus in Ayin Beis, Hemshech Ayin Beis of the Rebbe Rashab, Hemshech Terav, which refers to the year 1912, um, which uh, you can join, it's on Zoom and YouTube, live, or you can listen to the archives as well, as well as other resources that you can please take advantage of. So going back to where we are now, we're going to be discussing timely matters, like in this case, the month of Adar, the Parsha, and questions that are submitted by you. And I have to thank you for that because you are part partners and participants, active participants in this unfolding program. As I respond to the best of my ability to, to the questions that people ask. And as you know, there was no question, that, as I said, is taboo or off limits. So we go through it all. So much has been covered, but there's always more. People keep asking me, how many more questions can there be? But that's like asking how much more life there can be. Life is life, and life has always going to have questions and always going to have issues. We need clarity, challenges, difficulties, setbacks, and positive things. And navigating life is the greatest challenge of all, navigating but not just to survive, but to thrive. So with that, let's go right into the month of other. We'll talk about chassidus applied to other. Of course, the most important question is what opportunities does this month offer us? So, as I mentioned, mishenichnas other marbim besimcha. The most 
the most the practical, the most uh, obvious reason for that is, why do we increase in joy when other begins? Because it's the month of Purim. But Purim will happen in two weeks from now. So why Mishanichnas Adar? Why when we enter into Adar? And the answer is because Purim transformed. It's the month that was, everything was transformed. Purim transformed the terrible decree of genocide that Haman had convinced Achashverosh to kill every man, woman, and child, Jewish man, woman, and child in his kingdom, which included 127 nations, which was essentially the entire world. And that was overturned and transformed into miyogin lesimcha, from negative to the positive, from a day of grieving to a day of great joy. So it wasn't just going forward. Purim also transformed in ba- the past. And when, did the, and when is the month? The month which is the entire cycle of that month of Adar, which could have been the worst possible month, ended up being the best possible month. So so as soon as Adar comes in, we already have that power. Now, why did Haman choose this month? As we know, he threw lots. And it came on the of, uh, month of Adar. That it would be, and he realized the month of Adar is the day when Moshe Rabbeinu died. In his words, passed away. So he thought it was a bad sign for the Jewish people, the great Moshe Rabbeinu. What he didn't know was, as the Talmud says, that it was also his birthday. So bottom line is, that's the month. And then within the month, it was a particular day designated when we celebrate Purim. So it's the entire month. In fact, Purim actually transformed the entire situation. So it's more than just joy. It's a joy that has the power to transform. In simple English for all, each of us, it means we have many different difficulties in life. Unfortunately, sometimes tragedies. God should protect us all. Hoyle siya. The sakum pamayim, we should never have to talk about it. But things happen, and then we feel demoralized, broken, hopeless. So Purim teaches us, not only that can we overcome it, but we can transform it, and it become the greatest form of joy. And that's by recognizing that no matter what happens in life, there's an invisible hand, the story of Purim, an invisible hand of God at work. And there's a deep Rosh Pratis, and the story is not over until it's over. And when it's over, things get transformed. That's the power, nepach lehem. So, what is joy? Joy is not just a state of elation, of ecstasy, of feeling good. Joy is a deep state of understanding and pre-appreciating. And when I say understanding, I don't mean understanding necessarily with the mind, but understanding, perceiving from the depths of who we are, that you are where you are right now, this time and this place is where you should be. It's the joy of life. It's the joy of the blessings of life. And even when there is a setback or a, or a seeming setback, it may appear that way, it's all part of the joy of life. Which explains why the Gemara says, Kishem of just as when of enters, we diminish in joy, so too, in other, in other, when other enters, we increase in joy. What's the equation? Why bring these two together? This is the other ant- antithetical. Of is the month of Tisha B'av, the ninth day of Av, the day of the destruction of the temple, and the saddest month, the saddest days of the, the Jewish calendar. Because it's all a cycle. Even the purpose of the miyut b'simcha, the diminishment in joy is also ultimately to bring joy. At that point, you don't see it yet in a revealed way. In addition, of course, there's the Munkin Shadr, Mincha Salazar's interpretation, Mishanichnas of, when of enters, Mamayitin, Mamayitin and of, you diminish the negativity of of, Besimcha, through joy. Through Kud Yashem Yashar, Mesam Chilev, things that you're allowed to do that are joyous, whether it's learning Torah, doing mitzvahs, as the Rebbe emphasizes. Other the joy is revealed. And joy is, of course, a critical component in life when you see people who do something with joy not just they do it they do it with a far more alacrity far more expansiveness far more drive enthusiasm sometimes you do something it doesn't have that joyous element so so with that being said this month has that power and when you enter other an energy enters now like every energy you have to create a keli a container and that's the container which is the joy that we generate. 
So then, of course, comes the question, how can you command someone to do joy? Joy is an emotion. Can you regulate? Can you command? Can you force an emotion? You can command someone to do something even if they don't feel it. But you're actually commanding here an emotion. Serve God with joy. So one of the answers for it is, well, they have two answers. One answer is that joy is the natural state of the human being. Look how a child is born. Except in very rare circumstances, due to other factors in most cases, every child is naturally happy. They naturally smile. They're naturally joyous, enthusiastic. Why? Because a soul is connected to its purpose and its divine source. So what's there not to be joyous about? Think of it the other way around. The fact that we live in a world that can have no joy, we consider, some of us think that's the default state. That's not the default state. That's the anomaly. That's an aberration. That means something isn't working. It's just like the natural state is healthy. The natural state of the universe is a healthy, integrated system at work. It's only when toxins come in to play that the human body or the human being, or nature, begins to go off course. And toxins can be either imposed by other people, imposed by circumstances, or imposed by yourself, through your own behavior. A child is seamless. There is no duplicity, there's no lying, there's no deceit. But then when adults around this child, and and life around, begin to pollute the child, that's when things change. The same thing with joy. Joy is the natural state of belonging. You're not even conscious. It's not even a conscious joy. It's just there. It's like health. It just feels right. When something goes wrong, that's when it takes us off course and we become misaligned. So when we're told to do joy, we're basically saying just go back to who you are. I'm not talking about imposing some type of outside force called joy. It's saying be the you. And how do you become you? Find out why you're here in this world, why God put you here, why did he give you life. Every morning we say, Moda'ani, thank you for returning my soul to me. All this is acknowledging your connection. And when you feel that connection, it's a natural joy. There are many levels of joy. You could have joy of a joy of, of, of the birth of a child, the joy of marrying off a child, the joy of a success in a particular area of your life. But the fundamental joy begins with the very joy of life itself, Simcha Sachaim. You're happy with your life. The Rebbe Tzidchai Mushka, whose, whose yard site we just honored, Chav Beishvat, was once asked, when, is the hap- when was the most happiest time of your life? And she said, right now. Meaning that every moment is the happiest for that moment. You don't compare. Everything has is you navigate through it, and when you feel that you are belonging, and that you feel connected, you feel you're here because this is what where God wants you to be, there's no greater joy than that. So when you're not sure, when you, when you have doubts, a loss of self-confidence, a loss of identity, you look at someone else and say, oh, maybe that's what that belongs to me. Well, why don't I have what that person has? That's when we begin to agonize, when we begin to feel we're lo- missing something. But you have everything you need because you were created by God and he cre- gave you all the resources. You see another person, so there's healthy competition. Let that motivate you to go be- get better, not to feel terrible, to say, okay, I see that as an example. That should get me going. That's a, um, a catalyst, a motivation. The second answer is similar to what it says about Ava, about love. Same question is asked. How could you say a mitzvah, love God, or love your fellow? Love is an emotion. How could you regulate it? How could you command an emotion? You could say even if you don't feel anything, or even if you have a negative feeling to someone, still be kind, still invite them as a guest, still visit the sick, etc. But how could you regulate an emotion? Says the Magid, the Mizrucha Magid, that the mitzvah is on his bonanus, that when you contemplate, as the Rambam says, hey, how does a person come to love and reverence of God? By contemplating on the beauty and design of the universe, and by its magnitude. The multitude, the sheer mass, and godly, the quality of existence. And the same thing with another human being. Contemplate on their soul. Contemplate, as I just said, why did God put them here? 
So even on the outside, it may look something that you, is unbecoming. But lech luma shasani, as the Gemara tells us. Even if something doesn't look very appealing to the eye, go to the Creator who crafted me. God put this person here. That's why it says, Oye as the Alter Rebbe in chapter 32 in Tanya says, to love the Brias. What means Brias? The, creature, the, create, the creatures. Why creatures? Because even if they don't have any other quality, the quality that God created them is already enough and you contemplate to bring a love. God created this person. That means this person has value. God found it important to create this person. So when you contemplate, says the Magi, that automatically and naturally will bring love. So the question of Chassidus asks, so then why is the mitzvah not on contemplation? Because contemplation is just a process that brings to love. Because the love is really there. Like I mentioned before about simcha, joy. It has to be uncovered. So the process is by contemplating, to become conscious and aware of it. There's sometimes someone can have great qualities, even someone that is close to you. But if you don't think about it, you can easily get distracted or forget. That's why we can sometimes have negative feelings even to people we love. But then you start focusing and saying, one second, who is this person? So his bonanus basically gets rid of the clutter, gets rid of the distractions, gets rid of the, the, the blindness that we sometimes have and not seeing what we really are blessed with. And one more question about the month. What is its sign and tribe? So the sign, the, the mazel of Adr is dogim, or is known in the world, Pisces, fish. And the tribe usually two opinions when it comes to the, to the months. It's either Yosef or Naphtali. And the message of it is, first starting with the fish, fish is a lesson of blessing. But not just a blessing, it says, because it's dover asamim in a'ein abrochem mutsuya, bloch is not found except dover asamim in a'ein, something that's concealed from the eye. Now when you see it, sometimes the eye can have an effect on it Something that comes in under the radar, fish under the water, multiply. And that's why the, bless, the blessing is you shall multiply like the fish in the sea. What's the deeper reason for that? Because true blessings come from a more hidden place, the hidden worlds of Alma Discasia, the hidden worlds of water. And water itself is a sign of blessing. There's even an opinion that fish are considered like water. Which means Abshim Ben Gamliel says that when you go to the mikveh, and the fish touches you, is that considered a chasitza? As if something's blocking, says no, because the fish is like water. There's another opinion that the haloch is differently, but doesn't matter, but the idea, the concept. So fish represent the higher reality, the reality of water connected to its source, which again brings us back to joy. Joy, source of blessings, connected to the source, feeling that connection. A fish in the sea is always happy, because it knows and it's completely seamlessly connected to what, what its purpose is. On land, we can sometimes forget. A fish, like the Gemara says, said to the fox, who was trying to entice the fish to leave the water because he wanted a good lunch, a good dinner. They say, you're such a wise, such a shrewd animal. Don't you realize that we can't leave the water? It's our source of sustenance. It's not an option. So too, says Rabbi Akiva, that's why a Jew can never leave Torah. You have to always be in Teira, because Teira ain't my Teira. Teira is compared to water. Okay. As far as the tribe goes, Yosef means he suffer, blessing, addition, abundance, and so on. And then there's the two sons of Yosef, Ephraim and Menashe, which is also Ephraimi, which is to multiply and to flourish and to thrive. And Naphtali is, comes from the word Naphtali to conquer. Even the negative, podium is about transforming the negative into the positive. So one of the explanations is Naftali represents that idea. So bottom line is this is a special month. When other enters, we increase in joy. It says that in this month is Mazoli Gever, body Mazli, that the Mazl of Eden is stronger and more powerful. First of all, because of Purim, but remember, the fact that Purim came in this month means because the month has that energy. Megalgal and Schus, Liyem Zaka. The energy, Moshe oh, Rabbeinu, his birth and his passing, but even his passing is also, we know, the passing of a tzaddik is also a special day. That Pe'el Yeshua is Beket of Aritz, where all his Aveda elevates and brings it back down and affects redemptions and salvations even in the depths of this world. 
So it's all about joy, transformation, abundance, and blessings. Now we have to make the keli for it. That's what Chassidus Supply teaches us. That takes Chassidus and teaches us how to find, recognize your neshama, that fundamental connection that brings that type of simcha. And simcha poides gedel. When you have joy, it pierces all boundaries, all resistance, all opposition. That's what joy does. When you see people have joy, they have ability to do things that they usually wouldn't do. Just that type of heightened spirit that lifts you up and you don't see obstacles that were yesterday obstacle. When you're in a state of joy, you don't feel the obstacle. You just march forward, forge ahead. Okay. So now let's go over to Truma. It's Pasha. Truma is such a fundamental Pasha, as we discussed in previous pro- in, the pre- in, a pre- in last week's program and previous programs, that this is the third of the three main events: the Jews leaving Mitzrayim, Matan Teda. Leaving Mitzrayim includes Kriyas Yamsuf, the parting of the sea. Matan Teda, receiving the mandate, the blueprint that God gave us how to transform existence. And Mishkin is the implementation of that transformation by taking Vayichuli Truma, taking Kesav Zov and Necheshes, gold, silver, copper, or silver, gold, copper, and all the other 13, or the 12, 13, 15 materials, and turning them into a Mishkin. Build for me a sanctuary and I will dwell among you, within you and through you, to the entire world. That's the theme of the Pasha. So it's pretty obvious what the message is, what the lesson of this Pasha is. The first lesson above all is that each of us has to do that. So even though we don't have a physical temple, but beautiful sikhid that's worth reading and learning, Mugeth, edited by the Rebbe, who the Rebbe brings from my modern, from the Friedrich Rebbe, that explains that in many ways today is the Iker Mitzvah, because even during the Beis Amigdash, the Kavana was, the, the intention was that it, God should dwell, not in a building of, of whether it's uh, materials or wood or stone. It was also Veshechante Besech, and that's what the verse says. But then people could make the mistake or someone could think, hey, it's a building. Today, we have no other option until Mashiach comes when the, the third temple will be rebuilt. When uh, that, that we have no option, but with Shechanti Besechem. The Rebbe there calls that each of us should turn our homes, even children in their rooms, into a base Chabad, a base Teda, a Vedin Gmil's Chasadim, a house and home and room permeated and saturated with the three pillars of Teda, a Veda Tfila, and Gmil's Chasadim, kindness, to have in every home a and every room to have both a, a chumash, which is teda, a siddur, tefillah, and gmilz chasad, matzdokah box, and use it, obviously. But it's also to remind us to, that the whole purpose of the home is to make v'shechante b'seichem. Most basic type of applying the idea of mishkin in our personal lives. And every detail that's described in this week's chapter and the coming chapters which continue, Truma, Tetzav, Kisiso, Vayakal, Pekude, are all about the Mishkan, because it's the fundamental core of the purpose of existence. So all the details are all lessons to us how in each aspect of our lives, whether it's the walls of the Mishkan, whether it's the Kalim, all the different aspects of it, whether it's the offerings, and indeed the Maimar Basilagani that we just learned for Yushvat, is that central theme, that the central theme of all of life and especially the Deir Ashvi, the seventh generation, is what? To make the world into a Mishkan for God. Then the beginning of creation, the primary Shekhinah was down below, but then through the sins and transgressions, the world was misaligned. Like I said before, we wandered off. A dissonance entered. And Avram Avinu reversed the, And then it got worse, generation after generation. Then Avram reversed the process. And Moshe Rabbeinu, the seventh generation from Avram, in his generation, they built the Mishkan, returning the world to the way it was in the beginning of creation. But the job is not over. It wasn't permanent. The Mishkan then would lead to the other temporary sanctuaries and ultimately to the permanent sanctuary of Bayez Rishon, the first temple, then the second temple. But both were ultimately destroyed, God forbid. So our work over these thousands of years is to build a world that this time when the Beis Amidish comes, 
Ashlishi comes, the third temple. Migdashad Neken Yedecha, this will be a bias Nitzchi, eternal, forever. Because the world has been transformed, the entire world, into Veshachante Besecham. So it's the central theme of Bosa Legani, and then it goes on to speak about the details of the offerings, which is the idea of Adam Kiyakir Mekem, that we have to offer ourselves and bring ourselves closer carbon from the word Kiruv, and we do it through the Ruach, by transforming the Ruach Shtuz, the insanity, that's Atzei Shittim, the wood that was used in the temple, and through Kroshim, the beams, and all that represents the transformation of a dark world, a world of negativity, a world of lies and deceit into a world of truth and divine and holiness. So the message is quite clear, and especially now in the Deir Ashvi, as the Rebbe points out, the Maim Abbas Ligani Tovshinirat more than points out, it's the, establishes the mission statement of our generation, like Moshe Rabbeinu, is to finish the job that began thousands of years ago, and more specifically with the Alter Rebbe, with the beginning of Chassidus Chabad, we're the seventh from that generation, and bring the Gula Hamitis Vashlem. And that's just the theme of this week's parsha, the theme of our times. And today we have the ability to do so like never before, due to, first of all, the freedoms we have, and don't have to fight all the enemies that we once had to contend with. Today the enemy is within, the apathy. And secondly, we have all the technologies and all the tools and platforms and ways to distribute your futsu minusecha chutzah. To the point of reaching every corner of the world, with mola arads, to the point of mola arads, deyes Hashem kamayim la yamechasim, filling the world with divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea. So here's some questions on this parsha. Why is it important that we have a holy temple? Why is it important that we have a Beis Amigdash? We haven't had a Beis Amigdash for close to 2,000 years. And today our communities are still flourishing. We have many big yeshivas and shuls in every major city around the world. And with the amount of Torah classes available online for free, more people are studying Torah now than ever before. So what exactly are we missing by not having a Beis Amidish? What can the Beis Amidish accomplish that we aren't able to accomplish without it? <clears throat> okay. Well, so firstly, let's go back that the Ebishter would never deprive us of the ability to fulfill our mission in life. So as much as we say, that due to our sins we were exiled from our land, which means even when you're in the land, you could be exiled and displaced spiritually. Yet, as the Hashem told Yecheskel, the Novi, when he asked what will be, he said, build Batik Nesias, Batik Medrashas, build mini sanctuaries, shuls, academies, yeshivas, places of learning, places of davening, and that will be a mini sanctuary. But then, remember the Pasuk, it's not just a shul or a yeshiva. Shranti b'seicham. That I will never take away from you, God forbid. On the contrary. That's the entire focus. To build in your heart and soul a place for God. Through teda and mitzvahs. To build a home. Every room that we discussed before. So that's correct. And yet, there's still something about the physical Beis Amigdash. And what is that? Not just now. We're waiting for Mashiach to come. But also the first base of the second base of all the way back to the Mishkan. Because the purpose is to actually transform the physical reality. So though we can do it in our homes and through our shuls and our yeshivas and our bote knesis and bote midrashas, but it's still a migdash ma'at. still a mini sanctuary. The sanctuary, the way God planned it and laid it out in Pasha Truma, every detail, the physical ark and a physical menorah and a physical mizbeach altar, and a physical shulchan table, and the second, ar- the second altar, the outer altar, and the walls and the details are all part of the divine plan, which reflects, say, the Ishtalshas, the cosmic order, exactly as God wanted it to be. And it shouldn't just be spiritually. Today we do it spiritually. Even if our homes become a migdash ma'at and we turn our homes into a mini sanctuary, it's still not quite the same level of holiness that the Beis HaMidosh has. A holy of holies that on Yom Kippur the high priest would enter and be able to bring all those offerings. 
So in Dira B'Tachten, the ultimate consummation of it is when it's physical. It's like, why was it not enough to have Mat and Teir? Why do we then have to build a Mishkin? Because you want to consummate, you want it to become a reality. It would be the concept like two people fall in love and they get married all in a sacred way, but they don't have a home. In this world, we need a home. Ain't no dem belay bias, a person is not complete without a home. And Kavyochel, so to speak, above, it's rooted because Nesava Kodesh Baruch Elias Lei, Wa Dira Lei is Baruch B'Tachtein. God desired to have a Dira home. A home means where it can be expressed. It's his own, an intimate way. Can that be done in the hearts and souls? Absolutely. But it's complete in this physical world, Afka. Can Atzilus be a Dira B'Tachtein? Not Tachtein, it could be a Dira to some extent. It is a Dira. Iyu V'chayu Echad, Iyu V'gamu Echad. It's a kelit for elikus for godliness, but it's not a tachtenim. The ultimate tachtenim is in the most physical part of the universe. So, as much as we're able to do, we do it today. But the ultimate is going to be also when you have an actual physical base amidish in Yerushalayim, Yerakedish, on the Harabais, and in there you have all the sections and all the parts that all are, so to speak, a window, a channel, an interface between the divine and existence. And from the base amidish, misham yitzah eda. The light will illuminate, and the entire world will be a dira le'iz barach. But like in any type of dira, there are rooms and there are different sections and different areas. So as much as it says that, um, that the world will be Eretz Yisrael, Tispashe B'chol Eretz Yisrael will spread all over to all, the, all the lands of the earth, the Yerushalayim will spread to all of Israel. The Besamidus will spread to all of Yerushalayim. The Besamidus will be even a higher level of Kedusha. Because part of it is also the diverse levels of higher and higher and higher, just like you have in the Beis Hamidosh itself, the Azara, the outer chamber, then you have the Kedosh, the El Moed, the Kedosh, and the Kedosh Kadashim, the Holy and the Holy of Holies. So these levels are all critical as well, both spiritually, but ultimately also physically in an actual building. And we see naturally when people speak about ideas, thought, speech, as much as they're aligned, when you do something in action, an action means not just you do an action, you build something, a permanent building, an edifice. There's something that's hard to, to that cannot be replicated and it's hard to, to fully appreciate that until you actually have that physical reality. Okay. So without in any way minimizing, God forbid, all the opportunities we have today um, with the learning Torah and so on, with the Beis Amir, it shall only become even more complete and even more manifest, even more permanent in the fullest sense of the word. And remember, at the end of the day, Vishakhanti Bisechom is that God rests in this physical world in the Beis Amigdosh. That's why that's the place that, that Yaakov said, Zeshara Shamayim, this is the gate to heaven. That's the interface, exactly in the Beis Amigdosh. This doesn't mean we can't be an interface, but that's the ultimate place where that interface manifests. And that itself will enhance our learning tater with all the technologies and everything you mentioned in your note. Can you please ask Rabbi Jacobson to speak about some of the materials used to make the Mishkan and their significance? We know from the Basilagani Mimer that the significance of the wooden pillars being made of atse shittim, red acacia wood, is to teach us the concept of shtuz de gdusha. But what is the significance of some of the other materials such as silver sockets, wool, and animal skins? Okay, so can't go through everything, so just give some sources. There's a beautiful sefer called Teira Se'ela from the Rama, Rama Isha Isulish, the the Mapa, the Rama of Shulchan Aruch. So the Rama wrote a sefer called Teira Se'ela, which is essentially a kabbalistic work. And there he brings every aspect of the Beis Hamidrash, every detail, literally. And explains what it means in Ruchnis, the spiritual, the spiritual component of it. So if you really want to have details, go there. Everything is there. There are other places. Chassidus, of course, talks about this. There's a Rishima from the Rebbe Amenera and other places the Rebbe brings from the Shalah and from the Rabbeinu Bachai and other places how the Beis Amigdash and the Mishkan were all structured like say the Ishtashlis and the human body is a microcosm of that as well. We have three sets of Reish, Guf, Regal is like the three sections, Kedush, Kedoshim, where the Oren is, the Resh, and, and the Kedush, the three, right, left, and center. You have the Meneda to the left, you have the Shulchan to the right, and the, and the Mizbeach, Apnimi, in the center. And then the Regal refers to the outer Mizbeach, and the Oyel Moed, 
where that goes out to the outer world, and that's where you brought the offerings of the animal, the animal, including the animal soul that comes from the outside world, and you transform that to carbon Lashem, close to the divine. But then every detail is spelled out in Teres Ela. In different Maimarech Siddhas does discuss, just to give one example, discusses in the beginning, let's say, Teres the beginning of Pasha Vayigash. So he explains the difference why in the Mishkan, the walls, and many of the materials were made from Tzemeach. Like you said, um, from things that, that, are, uh, that grow, from vegetation. The Beis Amigdash was primarily made from stones, Wood, for example, is tzemeach, the atzei shitim, the acacia wood, which he does say in Taki and Basel again, I need a lesson from that. So there he explains, because tzemeach is higher than doimim. And the Mishkan, they didn't yet have the power to completely transform doimim, the mineral world, the stone world of mineral stone. So it went to say the Yishtalsha, so there's the medaber chai, and that's why they're also from wool and other, other materials that came from animals, you mentioned wool and other Sireizim and other materials like that, and Semeach. The Beis Amigdash, they were then ready, and, and Beis Amigdash is, is a Diras Kfa, a permanent home, whereas the Mishkan was a portable one. Now it would have the ability to, trans, to draw down godliness even in the daemon, ultimate transformation. And the thing is, like I said, it's still not permanent because the Beis Amigdash was destroyed. The place, however, remains holy. Kedusha lezazimim came. You're not allowed to walk on the Harabais. But when Mashiach comes, Hashlishi, then it will be permanent forever. Mikdash Adnei Ken Yedecha, forever and ever. Because the world would then have completely been transformed. So that's just an example of why different, different materials represent. Now, each material itself is, reflects another part of existence. Both within the world of the animal kingdom, the world of vegetation, Mentioned Atsi Shittim, and the Maimri also brings Kroshim. So Shittim, Atsi Shittim, as you point out, Shittim also has the meaning of Shtus de Umaza, the insanity of the animal soul, which you transform, that's what's Atsi Shittim, to a holy insanity, to a holy super rational behavior. Kroshim has the word Sheker in it, you transform the lies, the deceit, the duplicity of this world into Kesher, a bond, and Keresh. A beam that stands up and holds up the base, I mean, the Mishkan. And the same thing with other details. Everything has its place. Just to give another example, there was the Brichim. The Brichim were the fasteners that connected the walls. And then there's the Briach HaTichim, the middle rod. That ran from one end to the other. This wasn't just an architectural element. Chassidus brings, the Alter Rebbe brings it in Tanya, because the Midah the the kavam tzoi the bria chatichin represents teferis and teferis runs through all of ishtalshlus. It's the middle rod that connects malchus yesod teferis das all the way to keser. Compassion rachimim midas harachim yud gimel midas harachimim. So all these levels are all represent different things in the mishkan. So the physical mishkan was a mirror and a reflection of all these spiritual levels, including ourselves, and we, when you study it, you're studying yourself. How to align each part of our own part, our, our medaber, our chai, our tzemeach, and our daimon, because we also have all four. We have the mineral within us, which is our, like our bones, our teeth. We have the tzemeach here, nails. We have the chai, the vitality, the energy, and we have the daimon, the medaber, the human part, the intelligence. Like the Mish, like the Kedush Kadoshim, the Ad, but also the Chai. The Chai is part of transforming our vitality in that same form. Mina Chai, Mina Tzemeach, Mina Mina Daimim. So these are just some of the aspects, but more details I would suggest looking in Torah Seila, and also a good place to look up things up are in the indexes. But they're all together gathered together today in Sefer Lekutim Dach Tzemach Tzedek, which I had one the honor to be one of the editors of that. But there it's like an encyclop- encyclopedia where you look at Mishkin or you look at Sidiizim or you look at Adonim or any other aspects you can find the Chsidis of it, the Pnibis Hatera, the Kabbalah of it and other aspects that the symbolism of each aspect of the Mishkin and the Beis Amigdash.
Okay. Where did they get the trees to use for wood to build the Mishkan in the midst, middle of a desert? Were the trees magically put there by Hashem just like the man magically appeared every day for people to eat, meaning the bread from heaven? No. Rashi from Medrash, Tanchoma brings exactly this question. He asks exactly that. Where they get, where they get this wood from? And the answer is that Yaakov Avinu, in his foresight or prophecy, and was able to see that they would, Eden will build, the Jews will build a Mishkan in the Midbar. So he brought seeds of Atzei Shittim, of Akeshi wood from Israel when he went, came down from Canaan, Israel, when he came down to Mitzrayim. Those seeds were planted, and with that, they had the wood that they carried with them when they left Mitzrayim. And the same thing is with other materials. That's what Rashi brings straight from Medrash. And that itself has many lessons about, first of all, the foresight and understanding that the whole purpose of this wood is in order to build a Mishkan. So even though it was taka built in the Midbar, but they had it all beforehand. On a deeper level, uh, there's a sikha from the Rebbe that he explains that they had it all ready. They had everything prepared which means that each of us in our lives, we have everything we need to build our Mishkan, to build our sanctuary for the divine. You have your home, you have all the resources, all the materials. Now the only thing is we have to build it. That is up to us. That's the mitzvah that we have. Also the Migdash, but the materials we have, but you have to be wise enough to align them and use them not for just your own purposes, but to turn everything, everything, our money, a gold, silver, copper, our skins, our materials, everything has to be used. L'shem shemaim, b'chol and above all, b'shachanti b'seicham, for holy purposes to the point that we actually permeate it all because that's where the reason it was created. The Medr says the only reason God created gold was in order, v'nivrezov elu b'shul mishkan. Gold was created for the mishkan. The only thing, because of Khira, God gave free will the free will that you could use it also for something opposite, building a golden calf. But the whole purpose of gold was in order to create, uh, to, to build a mishkan with it. The whole reason we have wood is to build something holy from it. Your job, all your resources, all your gifts and blessings, your talents, they were all created in order for you to turn them into a mishkan for godliness. It's an attitude to look at how we look at life and the purpose of our lives. That doesn't mean we don't have personal benefit. But like he explains in time, you you eat, you drink. Yes, you're getting strength, but what are you using the strength for? To serve God, to fulfill your purpose. That's the purpose of it all. That's how we have to think about our lives. And that's the ultimate lesson. So Yaakov Avinu understood that to be the purpose. So he made sure that they would have the materials that they would need. And even when we're in a desert and you feel everything is barren or arid and there's nothing there, it's not true. Even in the desert, you come fully, fully equipped with everything you need in your tool chest, in your arsenal, to be able to build a Mishkan for God. Okay. Let us now move to some other questions, some follow-up, some timely events. Start something with Chav Be'i Shvat. What contributions did the Rebbitzin make to the Hasidic movement? So we spoke about this last week. Spoke about Chav Shvat and the different things about the Rebbitzin. It's an interesting question the way you pose it. I mean, you can ask the same question about every Rebbitzin. The Alter Rebbitzin, the Alter Rebbe's Rebbitzin, the Mittler Rebbitzin, the Machzadik, the Rebbe Marash, the Rebbe Rasham, the Friedike Rebbe. They're all Rebbitzins. But generally speaking, you don't hear much about how they contributed to Chassidus Chabad, except knowing that they were the rabbits. Melech and Malka, the king and queen, Zah and Malchus, a Melech, B'lei Matronisa. So most of it was really behind the scenes. Yes, we have stories, in some cases more stories than other, lessons, beautiful stories. We know that the Rabbeim went in every other Rosh Hashanah to the rabbits and to wish them a, a good year. And the Rebbe explains because it's the Malchus, Binyan Malchus. So we know the general, the general thrust of it, but the details, the Rebbe was the one that was much more pronounced. But it reminds me of the story where 
a couple of shluchim, a shluch and a shluchim were by the Rebbe once. And the, and the Rebbe, of course, would always address both of them as partners and saw them as such. And after talking to the shliach, the Rebbe turned to the shlucha, his wife, and says, how is it by you? She said, great, really, matzliach. But since the Rebbe is asking already, I want to understand something. My husband always gets credit. Friday night, he's at the head of the table, and I'm happy that he gets the credit. But very few times do they really appreciate all the work that we, the women, do. She wasn't complaining. She was just, I guess, felt open, so she said it to the Rebbe. So the Rebbe said, you're absolutely right. They should be complimenting you, and they should be they should be recognizing you equally, if not even more so, for all the work you do. But you have to know we live in a superficial world, the Rebbe said. In a superficial world, people, you see, when they come into a home, a beautiful home, they never say, oh, wow, how magnificent, how powerful the foundation of this building must be. They will compliment the walls, the furniture, the upholstery, the cutlery, the paintings, whatever, the lighting, the chandeliers, because that's how people respond. So uh, you're absolutely right, but you're the Akeres Habayis. And the foundations are sometimes invisible to the naked eye, and it needs someone who appreciates it to understand it. So they should appreciate it, but just always know that. When I read this question, this, this story came to mind. The Rebetzin, for sure, maybe even more than all the Rebetzin, was extremely discreet, but don't ever underestimate the power of an invisible foundation, just because you don't see it, and you don't see its active contribution on a daily basis. The Rebbe, you saw, it was active, everything. The Rebbe, the Fabrengens, the Vtsoyim, the Shlichus, I mean, everything the Rebbe did. But there's a foundation behind everything. And the Keres Abayas also applies to the Rebbe. This is not taking away, God forbid, from the Rebbe. It's a partnership. And that's what came to mind. So it's not always in Giluim. I'm, you know, and... Um, but then when you also have the stories, you start realizing the Rebbe, for example, gave full credit to the Rebbetson that it was her line that was the cornerstone of Judge Sifton's ruling on Hey Tavis, that the Rebbe Alein Balang succeeded. So one line like that can create a revolution when you start thinking, what is that Rebbe? The Rebbetson said that. That to me is a major contribution. In some of my Fabrengans on Hey Tavis, I spoke about it at length that that tells you something about what a Rebbe is. And the judge, a non-Jewish judge, accepted that, that he's not a private citizen when they asked her the question at the end of the deposition. So who do these books belong to? Your father or the Chassidim? And she answered, my father belonged to Chassidim. Unbelievable. The concept of an etzem, Siburein Emes, that a Rebbe is not a private citizen, the Rebbe is, belongs to the Chassidim, and through Chassidim lives on, Mazari B'chaim, Afu B'chaim, all the explanations. So if you want Dafka contributions, you can find them. But at the end of the day, they weren't every day and they weren't something that we all knew about. They probably were every day too, but we weren't aware of it. So that's why I think you have to put it in that type of context. Okay. Let's move now to sadly some events that were not so positive. So I have a question here, first of all, a few weeks ago, there was sadly two Yidden passed away after their plane crashed. Did the Rebbe ever say that we shouldn't fly a single propeller plane? Look, firstly, our hearts go out and we have to make sure not to equate the two. We're not blaming anyone. The Rebbe did indeed say in the 50s, I believe, probably later as well, that um, not flying a single propeller plane, which was in the early days of, plane, of I guess, in aviation, there was that option. Today, I don't know if that exists, maybe in private planes, I'm not sure. I don't know if it was an issue then and later was improved. I can't answer that question. But the Rebbe did say that, so it's something that we keep in mind. And, um, and obviously, it's not some type of uh, mystical or mysterious directive. Basically, it, you know, flying anything is, is dangerous, including driving a car. And the more you can do something that's safer, the better it is. So that's how I would put it in that context. But I don't want to connect the two. It's something that we should keep in mind. Just the Rebbe said, you should have a mezuzah in your car when you travel. So a mezuzah is a protector, like the Rebbe said, like a helmet. It's a helmet. A helmet, not a guarantee, but a helmet prevents anything that might, a bullet or, some, God forbid, or anything else that may be able to harm somebody. Okay. We also have had an earthquake 
in the Turkey or Syria area, tragically killing many people. So someone's asking, does it say in the Torah that earthquakes are punishments from Hashem for people doing Avedis sins? sins? Or is earthquakes just natural geological events that happen from time to time and will continue regardless of the behaviors of the inhabitants of a city? If the Torah... Oh, okay. Fine. Well, let's go back to the Rambam. Before we talk about earthquakes, the Rambam speaks about every calamity, every catastrophe that strikes an individual, and especially a community, should never be seen nikra nikris, random. Oh, just an act of nature. No. Everything has to be seen as a lesson. And it would be exodious, he says, cruel and insensitive for somebody to just dismiss it as just happening. It's a lesson to, for introspection and soul-searching and seeing how we can improve our lives and become better people. It's the basis of Hilchas Tainius, of all the fast days. It's the beginning of Hilchas Tainius. That's where the Rambam writes it. So that's first of all. For specifically, nothing happens by accident. It's true the way God created the world, the earthquake is a natural occurrence due to the, the different uh, the crust of the earth and the different... Um, how they crash against each other in different types of earthquakes. I once gave a whole series of classes on this topic. And, um, but, and same thing with the volcano, and the same thing for that matter, a rainbow. The Rebbe has a whole sikh about it. The rainbow is a natural occurrence when the rain and the sun, and it reflects a certain way. So why do we say that a keshes, a rainbow, is a um, sign from heaven that God will not bring another flood? Same thing with a lunar eclipse, a solar eclipse. The Gemara also says it's a simen tev, a simen ra, etc. So the Rebbe has a whole sikh from Tav Shalom Hay already printed in Lukut HaSichas, explains that God manifested in natural ways. It's a predisposition. It's not compelling. It's not saying that when a solar or lunar eclipse happens, God forbid negative things are going to happen. It means it's a time, like we said, Mishinichnas of Mar ben Mai Mayitim Besimcha. There are times that have a predisposition, just like with the mazolas. The mazolas don't control us. They don't pre- they're not predestined. We don't take away our free will. So bottom line is the same thing with earthquakes. They're in nature, but everything's the hand of God. We don't point fingers and start saying it happened because of this sin or that sin. Earthquakes have happened in places in Tzvas, in holy places. The Idris HaDom, it's called. So it's not our approach that we start blaming people. Just like when there came the hurricanes that created that wreaked dev, uh, havoc and devastation. So that's not our approach. You want to take a lesson for yourself? Absolutely, that's what the Rambam says. So that's how I would um, phrase it. Okay. Following up last week, I spoke about, in our ongoing, we talked about Shalom Bayes issues, husbands and wives, talked about a wife, a person is more religious, less religious. So following up, even though it's post-Super Bowl, but I thought I'd, I would read it because it's still uh, relevant, the, the message. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, we don't have a television in our home, but every year my husband and his friends rent a hotel room with a television and watch the football Super Bowl. This bothers me very much, and every year I convey to him how much it bothers me, and he completely ignores my concerns. I don't see a difference between a Super Bowl and a toilet bowl. <laughs> they both are a disgusting level of tumor, impurity, and we as observant Jews should stay away, far away from them. What can I say differently to my husband this year to convince him not to participate in this narishkeit anymore? Narishkeit is nonsense or foolishness. Okay, so I appreciate your sentiments, and uh, you can imagine... That a person should be learning Tater all day, and every second you don't, it's called Bittel Tater. The question is how you address it and how you approach it. And also what we'll call choosing your battles, if, you, if so to speak. Um, there are things in life that one should put their foot down, especially if it's really destructive, directly destructive, and especially if it's prohibited. There are other things that may not be the, the ultimate and definitely the highest standard, but sometimes it's not worth going into a battle over it. I don't know your, your, your relationship with your husband in other areas, but it would seem to me if this bothers you, probably some other things may also bother you. And even when something bothers you, and you're right, there's many ways to deal with it. The Rebbe once told a woman who said, my husband doesn't learn enough, comes home, reads the newspaper, falls asleep, 
should learn more. And she would wounds her husband, go to shul, go to Ashir. So the Rebbe said to her, as a wife, just like I would tell a husband, he's not mashpia in the rov of his wife, you're not his mashpia in his rov. She said, what happens? So the Rebbe said, go into a room and say some tilim for him. And you don't have to necessarily let him know that you did that. In other words, the climate of Shalom Bayes is also a mitzvah. It's not just, the, of course, learning Torah is critical. But sometimes if you start becoming a, a nudge, like the woman wrote last week, a nag, you probably create more, you undermine more, even though your intentions are good. So you have to be very wise and careful when it comes to these things. What you do personally is obviously up to you. And I would say this exactly to a man who says his wife is not doing enough. Or let's say you like the Super Bowl and your husband didn't and was against it. So you have to make sure it doesn't turn into a battle and then egos get into play and pride and so on. And in general, especially men don't like to be told what to do. So then how do you deal with it? There are many ways. You have to be wise. Chachmas noshim bonsa besa. The wisdom of a woman knows how to build a home. You don't always have to do it in a blatant way. A wise woman, the Rebbe would say, Ishak Sheda Eser Ritzayin Baila. Kosher woman, meaning a proper Jewish woman, Eser Ritzayin Baila, literally means she fulfills her husband's desire. What he says. But the Rebbe says, Eser also means to create. If he's doing what it says in Shulchan Aruch and what it says in Chassidus, then obviously a woman will respect her husband and live up to his expectations and because he's leading the way in a beautiful way, what the Rebbe wants a home to be like. But if your husband, for whatever reason, may not be doing it exactly, she creates the will. Creating the will doesn't mean dictating. It doesn't mean being a tyrant. It doesn't mean being a nudge. It means you find a wise way how to do it. You could do it with gentleness, with love, other things that your husband may, may appreciate, sometimes by osmosis, by example. So there are many ways... And again, case by case, I don't know the details. But there are many ways to approach it. So I would advise, Super Bowl is over by now. But I would advise, when it comes to things like this, probably best is to talk to your mashpia, talk to someone you know, and probably best not to make a, a direct confrontation. Especially when there's children involved, and so on. And again, you have to choose your battles. I am not in any way condoning or saying that what he did doing was right. But there are levels. Trust me, there are levels. You could probably imagine there are things that could be much worse. Again, this is not minimizing it. I'm just pointing out you have to know where to put your foot down and where not to. This is true across the board, not just with uh, this issue, many other issues, similar issues. Some more follow-up. So we spoke about names, but naming after the Rebbe, what names you give. So someone followed up by asking, apparently it is a minute to name a child after a deceased ancestor, tzaddik, etc., Yes, we discussed this in the last few weeks. Is this only a minig, the schuz, the newborn? Is it only for the merit of the child being given the name? Or do the, does the nesham of the deceased actually benefit by being named after him, her? If yes, is there a mucker in Talmud or Kabbalah for this? So I didn't really do f- complete research, so what I will say is it definitely says clearly that it's not just the schuz of the person who's being named, but also the one that's being named after. And that's one of the reasons that you keep the name exactly that's a Rebbe and you don't mix it with other names. So it is a schus, because the bottom line is, it's one of the reasons actually by Ashkenazim you don't give a name to someone who's alive because he's alive. But after he passes, it's a schus for him or her, meaning a parent or grandparent, to be named after, because in a way it perpetuates the soul and its name in this world. So it goes both ways. I believe it says it in some of the Likutim that gathered together the Minhagim about names. But the exact source I have not found. I will look. If somebody knows the source, please let me know and I'll share it with the public. Okay. Another follow-up about dreams. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, I submitted a question a while back about dreams. Due to my busy schedule, I was unable to listen to your weekly classes. If you did answer, answer it on one of your Chassidus Applied Sunday classes, would you be able to direct me to which episodes I can listen to that class. My email, okay, we'll send it to your email. Thank you so much. I greatly appreciate it. So let me tell you, I don't know if you're listening, we will email you. Actually, last week I spoke about it, but I've spoken about it a number of times, so we'll email you where the different episodes that I discussed this topic. 
Another topic, we're talking about how to make prayers exciting. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, last Sunday a listener asked why a secular concert, concert is so stimulating, and yet prayer and mitzvah are not as stimulating to him or her. I would like to share that maybe the listener could pray with engaged imagery, imagery that, they are the perf- that they are the performer, and in another word, or di- or an, and in another world or dimension, there's an audience, an amazing light show taking place from the prayer and mitzvah. Okay, visualizing that. Maybe using the imagination will help activate the senses so they experience how amazing their actions, which seem mundane, really are extraordinary. Thank you for all the work you do. Many blessings to you. Okay. Uh, that may be a balabatish away. I mean, the Rabbeim and the Chassidus in general talks about davening. When you learn Chassidus, especially Chassidus before davening, it's meant to help you envision the journey of tefillah, the four stages so you could imagine a journey, the soul, just like it says in Shamash and Asata bi Tahidihi, Ata Barosa, Ata Yitzarto, Ata Nafachta bi, the Ata Mashamra Bikibi. Soul begins pure. Exodus so says the world of Atsilis. And then it comes Ata Barosa, the world of Bria, and then Ata Yitzat Yitzira, and Asiya, and all the way down below. So it's a journey, the soul journeys, and Tfila is like a Sula Mutsavatsa, is a ladder that stands on the ground, Vereshimagiashamaima. And the top of the ladder reaches up into heaven. It's an interface. And malochim yerdim ve'elim, elim ve'yerdim. But they climb and they descend and descend. So that's all imagery that you could use in understanding that tefillah is exactly that—a real journey through these dimensions. The more you understand the dimensions, the more alive it will become. So thank you for that. We'll do one more question. It's also not such a positive, but we cover everything here. What can the family and friends of a young person who is in the hospital with a terminal illness do so that their prayers ascend to the highest levels of the heavens and elicit a positive response from God? May the same Hashem that made miracles and split the Yamsuf make a miracle and cure. Okay, the name of this person, unfortunately, since has passed. And may he live many happy, healthy years. But it could apply to anyone else that's in this situation. So the answer is, tefillah always helps. Sometimes you see it openly, sometimes not so openly, sometimes it takes time. So what we can do is pray with kavana as much as possible. We always pray. It's one of our greatest resources and greatest gifts. What Hashem does is up to Him. We have complete betoch and trakud v'zangud that God will answer our prayer exactly as we want it. But if after the fact not, that doesn't mean the prayer was a waste, God forbid. There's no such thing. You watered the garden, you were mamshil brachas and amshachas, the tefillah will accomplish something, one way or another. So we need to know that. But then comes the second half of the question that I received afterwards, sadly. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, the other day I sent a message via the forum to ask about the best way to die for someone that's very ill. I also requested that Hashem make a miracle and heal this and this person. I unfortunately must share the bad news that this person passed away early Shabbos morning as Nisham is now elevating. Is there a time in your Sunday broadcast to answer the questions of the best way to die for someone that is gravely ill? It is still appropriate to do so even though it's too late for this person, but hopefully the information can help others that have a relative or friend in the hospital. May Hashem bless that everyone who is ill has a refuah shlema, that all the hospitals have no patience and close down. Amen. Amen. We should only be blessed, especially as we go into the month of other body, Masli. And it's a healthy body, health, a healthy Masli, healthy Hamshachis and Brachis of joy. We should only have Simcha, Teva Nidava, Nigla in a revealed way. And anything negative should be transformed, Nepach, Chedesh Hashem Nepach Lehem, transformed, Lehud de Mesa, Eid of Simcha, Vesas, and Yakar, Miyogin, Le Simcha. Anything from the negative to the positive, because nothing is ever un- irredeemable. Even the negative has energy that, when harnessed and transformed, can elicit and produce unbelievable and unprecedented power. May that be the case in this month of Adar, and it should be Mishanich and Sadam Abin Besimcha, and Mismar Gu'ul Le Gu'ula from Adar march right into the Gu'ula Amitis Vashlema, especially through the work of spreading Chsidis, Chsidis applied included. Your foot's a minus, as Mashiach promised the Balshamtov. 
Everyone should have a good week. This has been My Life Chassidus Supplied. We're here every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. A good gebench to Chedesh, a good gebench time, Yod, and a good gebench to Tomid. Be well. This program is brought to you by My Life, Chassidus Applied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at chassidusapplied.com slash donate.